I invite you to enter your name and institution into the chat box along with anybody else um, or the number of people who are attending with you. Um, I'm Jamie Patrick Burns moderating today. I'm the digital archivist for the State Archives of North Carolina. Um, before we begin the presentation, I'd like to um, bring your attention to some of the upcoming um, State Electronic Records Initiative webinars that are coming up in spring. Um, it, on Tuesday, April 14th, join us for Don't Let All That Work Go to Waste, Documentation Strategies for Success, presented by Carly Dearborn, Sam Meister, and Nathan Tallman. Um, and for May and June, please stay tuned as we finalize our slate. And secondly, I'd like to um, remind you of some of our online resources. We have um, a series of videos on managing dig digital content over time, um, which is a set of six different videos. And we also have some frequently asked questions on BitRot that you can view. Um, and we are working on some more videos coming up later in the year. And I would like to introduce you to today's presenter. Um, Danielle Emmerling is Assistant Curator, Congressional and Political Papers Archivist at West Virginia University Libraries. In 2018, she served as Project Director of the Lyricist-Funded Feasibil Feasibility Study, America Contacts Congress. Her article, Civics in the Archives, Undergraduate and Graduate Students with Congressional Papers, was published in the American Archivist, and her chapter on Born Digital Materials Management in Congressional Papers appeared in the Digital Archives Handbook, A Guide to Creation, Management, and Preservation. She has served as chair of the Society of American Archivists Congressional Papers section and is on the executive committee of the Association of Centers for the Study of Congress. She earned a Master of Library Science and a Master of Arts in History from Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, as a reminder, all questions will be held until the end, but you can feel free to enter them into the chat box at any time. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Danielle. Well, thank you, Jamie, and thank you to COSA for hosting um, this webinar today. Um, and thank you all for joining us. So um, as Jamie mentioned, today I'll be talking about the America Contacts Congress project. Um, the project looked at how we can preserve and provide access to congressional constituent correspondence data, um, which provides a unique perspective on American representative democracy. So I'll provide you with some background about the challenges with constituent correspondence data, um, the development of a potential solution at West Virginia University Libraries, findings from our Lyricist Supported Feasibility Study um, and our lessons learned from that, and then I'll wrap up with how our efforts are progressing. Um, I'd also like to mention why this issue of congressional data may be of interest to COSA members. Um, we've heard from a handful of state archivists that states and governor's offices are using the same proprietary systems as congressional offices. So I hope that our experience can um, inform the work of this group um, and also perhaps lead to some collaboration. So uh, first, some background about congressional records and constituent data. The um, primary materials generated by the US Congress are separated into official and private records. The official records are those that are maintained by committees, um, which are related to legislative oversight and executive business, and they remain in the custody of the federal government. And once they're inactive, they are transferred to the Center for Legislative Archives at the National Archives and Records Administration. These are differentiated from the personal papers of members of Congress, um, which include materials created or received by the individual member and their staff members. They're preserved either as evidence of the organization and functions of the member's office or as information about that member. Because members of Congress own their personal papers, they decide where to place their collections. It's common for them to place their papers uh, with academic institutions like mine, 
um, with state historical societies or specialized centers for politics and policy studies. The constituent correspondence data falls into this category. So when constituents have an issue with a federal government policy or they need special assistance, often referred to as casework, they will contact their senators or representatives. As an example, in 2017, uh, when Congress was arguably seeing some peak engagement from constituents, members of Congress reported receiving upwards of a million phone calls per day and over 6 million letters per year. And this relationship we have with our representatives is really crucial to our democracy, and it's one of the core functions um, of a member's office. Throughout the 20th century, these interactions were documented in large paper files, um, like you see in the picture here, um, and to some extent they still are. But this began to shift in the 1990s when congressional offices began adopting proprietary electronic correspondence management systems, or CMS. Uh, since then, systems have only become more complex adding different features uh, such as scheduling. So you can see an example of what one of those systems looks like uh, or looked like in 2019 here. So both chambers must approve vendors of these systems. As of 2016, this list represented the approved correspondence management systems vendors for Congress. Four vendors provide services to both chambers um, and the House has two additional vendors. And you may recognize the names of some of these vendors. So early on, Congressional Papers Archivists recognized the importance of the data. Um, they also recognized that it would be really impractical and expensive to purchase proprietary systems for repository use. So instead, they worked with colleagues on Capitol Hill to devise a way to export the data to repositories. In the Senate, this resulted in a flat file 32 field archive format export with attached correspondence. It has been in use since the 1990s. In 2016, the Senate approved a more complete format, um, the Senate CSS Data Interchange Format, or SCDIF. Uh, a relational database containing more than 200 fields and attached correspondence. Um, in the House of Representatives, the House interchange format has been in use since at least 2013, um, and it is also a relational database export. If members choose to donate uh, data to a repository, it will be in one of these formats. Despite the largely successful effort to standardize these formats, in most cases, repositories have been unable to open the data files, um, much less manage preservation and access. Um, this is largely because the data sets are extremely large and complex. Um, they can't be managed with Microsoft Access or Excel, which are probably the most widely available tools uh, to most repositories. Further, repositories have struggled with how they will provide access while also protecting private and sensitive information. In 2017, the Society of American Archivists Congressional Papers section uh, began working toward a solution. In a report, it outlined these issues and stated that without a concerted effort, these data sets are in danger of disappearing. So around the same time, developers at West Virginia University Libraries uh, worked with me to create a potential solution. Um, they developed an open source tool that successfully accessed, searched, and displayed the data from the office of former Senator Jay Rockefeller. The constituent correspondence data tool allowed um, our repository for the first time to take a good look at the data in a potentially rep replicable way. The tool is built in PHP with a Laravel framework and Docker, which is uh, a container image that is lightweight and it contains everything needed to run this application, including the code, runtime, system tools, libraries, and settings. The tool was developed for the Senate archive format, the flat file, 
Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of the data in that tool to give you an idea of what it looks like. So on this slide, um, you can see a fairly complete 32 field metadata record from our data set. Um, but I'm going to zoom in so you can see what some of the fields contain. So here you can see that the in topic field has a fairly useful topic that you could search on. In this case, it's health. The in and out document name fields contain links where you can view the incoming and outgoing correspondence. If you were to click on the document link, you can see the PDF which the staff scanned into the system. In this letter from 2011, a person from St. Albans, West Virginia, is writing to the senator about an increase in their long-term care insurance. This example contains some interesting but private health information, um, and the tool would have difficulty searching this document, particularly the handwriting at the bottom. Now, if you were to click the out document link, you would see the office response. It's probably familiar to any of you who have contacted a congressional office. Um, there's kind of a canned response from the senators about the senator's position on health care and then contact information for state offices and resources. So this shows uh, the office response in a text format that would be easily searchable by the tool. And this is an example of a less complete metadata record in the data set. The in topic reveals a, a code. And if it is a code, I don't know what it means. Um, the in document name field is blank and the out document field contains the name of a file, but no link. Um, it could be lacking a link because the office didn't, didn't link to the correspondence. Um, the link could have been lost on export or our tool for some reason isn't linking to the file. But I hope these examples uh, give you some idea of the range of opportunities and challenges we face uh, with the exported data set. In 2018, uh, WVU Libraries received a Lyricist Catalyst Fund grant um, to kind of explore and conduct a feasibility study um, on our data. Um, so we worked with AB Consulting and an advisory board of experts um, to do this feasibility study. We wanted to determine um, whether the tool was unique and warranted further development, um, if it could be implemented at other libraries. We wanted to engage that library community to help us define technical requirements, identify um, and define needs of potential external users of the data and create a roadmap for our future development and governance of the tool. So our study was structured into three phases. In the first phase, the consultant and the advisory board identified um, priority user groups, the top three being processing archivists and librarians and qualitative and quantitative methods researchers. We envisioned the researcher groups being primarily faculty, but graduate students fit into these categories as well. Um, we also held initial focus groups with congressional and digital archivists who prioritize tool functions. So at first, we generated a really long list of potential functions, as you can see on our uh, virtual whiteboard. But we found that the top tool functions required by this group could be kind of boiled down to just five. And these included ingesting data that is one gigabyte or more efficiently, um, searching and browsing the data by date, date range, and subject, keyword searching the metadata and the correspondence attachments, generating reports on the status of the data, and integrating with other tools uh, that we currently use for curation. Next, we conducted parallel work, testing data sets and testing our preliminary ideas about external users. For data testing, we wanted to get a sense of the similarities and the variations in data sets and determine how the tool would handle various types of data exports. 
So we looked at four data sets, two of the Senate archive format, um, and one, one Senate relational database and one House relational database. Um, two members of our advisory board conducted the data testing at their institution, so they retrieved the data tool from GitHub, installed it locally, and then ingested their data collections. Um, one of our biggest takeaways is that the data sets really are massive, particularly in terms of the number of metadata records and attachments. Um, you can see here the uh, Saxby Chambliss data contains more than 5 million correspondence attachments. Um, the Harry Reid's data contains more than 16 million metadata records. Um, we also learned that ingesting the records into the data tool takes considerable computing power and time. The flat file archive format data sets were generally unproblematic with little to no variation in table structure and field usage, uh, which was a good sign. But we did find that linking the metadata to the attachments could be a bit more challenging to set up in the tool. The tool, um, as I mentioned, was not initially developed for relational databases. It can open those databases, but further development is needed to make them fully functioning. Um, we also saw that the relational databases offer more possibilities for understanding congressional office operations because data about staffers and workflows may be included if the office uh, used those tables. For user testing, uh, we held individual interviews with researchers who have experience with congressional archives or related resources. Uh, we also showed them the same examples I shared with you earlier of our data. So all told, we interviewed 10 researchers, asking them to talk through their research process and to evaluate the usefulness of the data to their work. We found with the qualitative methods researchers, um, they were largely political scientists, but there were some historians. Their primary needs are search, access, and read. Um, many of them use paper correspondence um, in congressional collections, but paper correspondence is usually voluminous. It's often you know, hundreds of record cartons, and it's usually organized chronologically or alphabetically. Um, this is a huge barrier for researchers who are typically searching by topic. So for them, the prospect of keyword searching is transformative and could lead to increased use of constituent correspondence. They also saw more value in the attached correspondence than the metadata. The quantitative methods researchers were all political scientists. Their methods are computational. They conduct large-scale data analysis to look for trends and patterns. They told us they are equally interested in the metadata and the correspondence attachments. They were very interested in exporting the data out of our system to their preferred format, uh, such as CSV or JSON. They don't care if data is incomplete or inconsistent. In fact, they told us um, they feel very adept at cleaning their data or hiring people to clean their data. Um, they were very interested in working across data sets from multiple offices. For us, that means finding a way to bring together data sets um, from multiple repositories. All of the researchers also identified a number of applications for the data in their work. So these include how representatives derive their ideas for policy and how policy issues become national in scope, um, how lawmakers change their views over time and how they frame those issues, um, how constituents perceive their representatives, and measuring constituent preferences and sentiments through sentiment analysis. The final part of our feasibility study was about summarizing our findings and creating next steps. So our lesson, our 
lessons learned uh, included the following. First, uh, we learned that the tool is unique and the desired functionality is pretty basic. So for both our processing archivists and researchers, um, the desired tool functionality is very basic. More important than expansive functionality is that it integrates well with tools we already use for curation and tools used by researchers for large-scale data analysis. Leading up to the project, we assumed that the tool functionality would need to be more expansive. So this is incredibly important and will save the community resources for development. Um, testing confirmed that the data sets are large with some incompleteness and inconsistency. The tool was developed to ingest the, the 32 field flat file Senate format. Um, it will display the tables of relational databases, uh, but it doesn't connect the tables or search across them. So additional development is needed to make those databases functional. Um, second, access to the data and attachments is transformative for qualitative and quantitative methods researchers. Researchers have not had access to the data before. So it has the potential to not only answer current research questions, but to reshape research questions entirely. Uh, research in this data is attractive for qualitative methods research because of keyword search and the potential to browse attachments. Um, the structured metadata, though, uh, is large scale and searchable, and it opens numerous doors for quantitative research. Um, again, Incomplete and inconsistent data was neither particularly surprising nor a significant barrier for researchers. Um, so that's good news for us. It means the tool needs to do less than we initially assumed. Um, both formats present opportunities to study communication between offices and constituents, democratic accountability, congressional history, and more. Um, the relational databases have the added potential for study of congressional staffing and office management of constituent communication. Third, it will come as no surprise that um, resources in the community and its associated stakeholders are limited. So archivists, we found our time and resource constrained and don't necessarily have the technical support they need to work with the data set. So the tool needs to be relatively easy to stand up and support, and we're keeping this in mind as we continue development. Um, and fourth, partnerships are key moving forward. For tool sustainability, we learned that we need to look at different models in addition to open source, uh, such as membership supported and software as service models. We are also looking at partnerships for access. Um, finally, the Congressional Archives community needs to determine the best way to partner uh, to govern preservation, curation, and access to the data sets in the long term. So our project uh, completed in 2019, but our work continues. Um, we're using the framework articulated in uh, the Lyricist report, It Takes a Village Open Source Software Sustainability. Um, the consultant used this report to create a roadmap to address the areas of governance, technology, resources, and community engagement. And currently, we're working to address these areas. Uh, since the end of the grant in 2019, the advisory board members have been working as a task force within the Association of Centers for the Study of Congress. Um, this organization is uh, nonpartisan and includes both curators and researchers. And this initiative fits within their mission to preserve the records of Congress and to promote the study of Congress. We are currently reviewing ways to kind of codify the charge of coordinating and overseeing this project and obtaining further resources for development and maintenance of the tool. The tool began as an open source project, but as I mentioned, we're looking at other sustainability models. We know that development would benefit uh, from greater demand for a data curation tool. 
West Virginia University Libraries is continuing um, to host the tool to develop it toward a minimum viable product and make uh, improvements to our documentation. Um, I would like to mention here that anyone interested in trying the tool uh, with data sets can find installation and data import instructions on GitHub. Instructions are available for both local and server installation. And if you do try the tool, um, please let us know how it works for you and if you run into any problems. Uh, lastly, um, we found that repositories generally lack infrastructure to provide access to large data sets, particularly those containing sensitive or private information. So the ACSC task force uh, will work toward a partnership with the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research at the University of Michigan. Um, we're working toward a pilot project in which a few institutions uh, will create agreements with ICPSR and transfer data um, so that ICPSR would then provide access um, to, to researchers. This, we hope, would create a model for other repositories. Um, further, it would bring us toward the goal of bringing together multiple constituent correspondence data sets which would be a great benefit to those researchers who expressed interest in searching across multiple data sets. With that, I want to thank you again for your time and attention today. Um, and you can find all of the feasibility study documentation on our America Contacts Congress page. Um, as I just mentioned, the constituent correspondence data tool and documentation is available on GitHub. And I would be happy to take any questions or comments you have now. All right. Thank you, Danielle, for that presentation. Um, if anybody has questions, you can um, type them into the chat box. Um, and I will read them out loud for the sake of the recording. So if any questions come up, go ahead. Um, I have a, a couple questions while we're waiting. Um, has anybody that you know of, any other institutions, used this tool, um, either for testing or kind of longer term? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so we have um, we have two institutions that have set up the tool for data testing, um, but I don't know of anyone else who has used it yet. All right, thanks. Um, so we have a question from um, Pennsylvania State Archives. How is redaction incorporated into the tool? Oh, that's a good, a good question. So um, redaction wasn't identified by our focus group archivist as one of the kind of top um, requirements right now anyway for what the tool needs to do for at least the curation side of things. Um, we know that it would probably be fairly easy to say, turn off certain metadata fields um, on the access side when, when we do start providing access with the tool um, so that um, researchers wouldn't be able to see names, for example. They would just have this kind of randomized data. Um, and we also think it would be fairly easy to do that um, in exporting the data to sort of remove some of those, those fields that could contain um, EII. It gets a little bit trickier with the attached correspondence. Um, it could be fairly easy to redact things like social security numbers, for example, if the correspondence is in a text format. Um, it's a bit more challenging, though, when we're looking at, say, a PDF like the one I showed um, that is scanned into the system. Um, it's harder to automate that sort of redaction. Um, and as we all know, it's, it's kind of um, 
unrealistic to think that we'd go in and touch each individual piece of correspondence to redact things. So we're still thinking that that question through. Um, but I do think that there would be ways to provide access to the data um, and sort of automatically removing some of the more sensitive information. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Give people a minute to, to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a question as well. I don't want to take up all the time, but um, going back to the beginning, the list of um, approved vendors that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, do you know how that list is generated and what kind of um, consultation with uh, archivists happens around that, if any? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question, Jamie. And it's a bit of a mystery. I think we were really only able to get, um, you know, to get that vendor list because we kind of had someone on the inside at the time. <laughs> um, I don't know how the vendors are approved. And I, I really don't think that um, an archivist is consulted during those conversations, unfortunately. Um, I think that um, vendors, and, and another clue to this is that vendors are not, are certainly not thinking about archiving the data unless, um, unless it's requested from the member office because the office is their customer. So um, archiving is not something that's kind of built in. I think in the the Senate, um, the newer Senate export, the Senate CSS data interchange format and the House interchange format, um, the interchange is kind of in those names because um, they're built for transferring data between systems um, in the Senate or, in, or between the Senate and the House. Um, but we're seeing that those might be good candidates for, for archiving formats as well. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Sarah Kuntz. Has anyone explored the idea of using the tool on congressional and a state level data set, perhaps from a governor's office? Um, hi, Sarah. Um, no. I don't think that we've looked into that, but we'd certainly be interested to see, um, you know, because they're the same, a lot of times the same um, vendors providing these systems to Congress and to governor's offices, at least that's, that's what we're hearing. Um, I, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't try that out. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. And, Perhaps someone that on this call knows uh, if governor's offices are, you know, exporting that data for archives, uh, for the archives, or if archives are working within those proprietary systems. I'm not really sure how it works on the, the state side of things. All right, um, any other questions that anyone has thought of? Um, I'm sure Danielle would be happy to answer some if you come up with them later on. Um, and let's see, um, for all of the um, participants, there will be a um, 
brief uh, survey evaluation that comes up um, after you close out of the webinar, and we'd appreciate it if you can fill it out and let us know um, your thoughts on um, the webinar. And you can um, stay apprised of COSA's offerings via the website and Twitter and Facebook. Um, so unless anything comes up in the chat box in the next couple mm -hmm. minutes, um, thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you so much, Danielle, for your participation. Thank you.